Welcome back as we continue our journey on Salvation is from the Jews with the author Roy Showman. When we ended the last show, we were discussing Romans 11, and I felt there were still some things you might want to share there. So why don't we go sure. back to Romans 11? We were kind of in the middle of Romans 11. Maybe recap us. And sure. Um, well, the, the topic of the show was, um, on the one hand, the return of the Jews, the, the conversion of the Jews to precede the second coming, how the... Um, one can see anti-Semitism and the attempt to exterminate the Jews, especially in the Holocaust, um, as, as an attempt to block the Second Coming. So we were talking about the, the role of the Jews in the Second Coming. And then um, what St. Paul has to say about the role of the Jews in the Second Coming and in the period between the First second Coming and the Second Coming in Romans 11. And the, um, we, all, Romans 11 is in some sense all about the interplay between Jew and Gentile in this period between the first coming and the second coming. And in order to illustrate that interplay, he uses the metaphor of the olive tree. And um, so I'll probably start with just a, a little summary of what he said there. He's talking about the salvation itself being like a cultivated olive tree. And he says, if some of the branches were broken off, some of the cultivated olive tree branches were broken off, and wild olive shoots were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree. If you're one of those wild olive shoots, don't boast over the broken off branches. If you do boast, remember, it is not you that support the root, that ro the root that supports you. Those branches were only broken off to make room for you to be grafted into the tree. But God has the power to graft those original broken off branches back into the tree at which point, how much better will they be suited to the cultivated tree because they were originally a part of it. So he's using this image to show the dynamic between Jew and Gentile and, and the mystery of the Jews' failure to recognize Jesus, that God veiled their eyes so that they wouldn't recognize Jesus to make room, in some sense, for the Gentiles to come into the church. In other words, God broke off some of the cultivated olive branches to make room to graft in the wild olive branches. So if you're one of those grafted in wild olive branches, don't boast, ha, 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 look at you, you know, stupid, dead, broken off branch, because God can graft them back in. And at that point, since they were originally part of that tree, how much better suited will they be? So again, there's a sense that when the Jews return to the church, when there's this widespread conversion of the Jews, they will bring something very special to the church, that they will, there will be a special resonance there. There will be a special gift to the church which uh, St. Paul, we mentioned this, but St. Paul said explicitly earlier in the same chapter also, he said, if their failure meant riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So again, that there's a special gift of the Jews. So let me um, kind of wrap up Romans 11 with um, the last few verses, because again, it shows the incredibly, incredible beauty of God's plan in this dimension. But after that, if we have a chance, what I'd really like to do is um, go back to some of the teachings of the recent popes, just so that people don't think this is an off-the-wall <laughs> Jewish chauvinist trying to you know, make Jews out into this you know, especially important thing for the church, um, you know, to see have any support from the church itself or from the popes. So then I'll go back and kind of, there's some incredibly beautiful things that the popes of the 20th century and now the 21st century have said about Judaism that I think really support this picture that I'm drawing. So here we go with that. So let me read the end of uh, Romans 11. Um, uh, well, I'll start a couple of lines before the end, repeating something that our listeners may be sick of by now, but it's, it's a good summary. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Okay? I mean, he packs so much into a single line here. <laughs> as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God, right? They rejected the gospel. They rejected Jesus. Right. By that yardstick, they are enemies of God. 
but for your sake, for the sake of the Gentiles, right? Because they had to be rejected so that there'd be room for the Gentiles. That then Paul continues, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, right? There's the whole story in the nutshell. Uh, the election, the Jews are the Jews because of the seed of Abraham. It was a promise made to Abraham that, you know, that the world would be blessed through his seed forever. They, they were elected in that line as descendants of Abraham, and they are still beloved for the sake of their forefathers. In other words, for the sake of their bloodline, for the sake of their genealogy, because of the promise made to the father of the Jews, so to speak, the, Abraham. The family bond that God made. The family bond. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Now, this is, gets very heavy and very deep and very beautiful here. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience. So they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also receive mercy. Okay, let me unpack that. Incredibly beautiful. Just as you were once disobedient to God, in other words, the Gentiles were unfaithful to God. The Gentiles worshipped demons. They worshipped idols, right? Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy, been brought into the church, because of their disobedience, because of the Jews' disobedience, because of the Jews' failure to follow Jesus. So now, they have been disobedient, they have failed to follow Jesus, in order that by the mercy shown to you, in other words, the entry of the Gentiles into the church, they may also receive mercy. In other words, the, the Gentiles in the church may convert the Jews, may evangelize the Jews. So because of the mercy shown to you, the Gentiles, the Jews, too, will finally receive the mercy of entering the church. So God says, I'm going to reunite my disobedient children. Exactly. And then he tells you why. For God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he may have mercy upon all. Do you see that, how beautiful that is? Beautiful. In other words, God didn't want anybody not to go through a period of disobedience, because then they would feel they deserved salvation. But this way, everybody has passed through a period of disobedience. The Gentiles were disobedient, so they know that the salvation that came through Christ is only a sovereign act of the heart of God. And now the Jews have been disobedient, so when they do enter the church, they, they have nothing to thank but God's mercy. They can't claim anything for themselves. As we're told, all have sinned and fallen short. Exactly. And this is a way to make sure that nobody excludes himself from that category. Beautiful. Isn't that incredible? Um, and, I, and I think of the divine mercy messages as you read that. Exactly. Which, which I'm sure we can unpack as we go through later, but that uh, the beauty of his mercy that he unfolds here. Exactly. So, so um, anyway, that's really, the Romans 11 is really the mother load of theology about this mystery of the interplay between Jew and Gentile. But it's really beautiful and it's really worth thinking about. And it really says a lot about, I mean, you, you look at the world and you, I mean, it's the, there's a mystery, there's a mystery to the Jews. There's a lot of mysteries to the Jews. There, I, and I'll, I'll support some of this with quotes from popes too. There's a mystery to their survival. There's a mystery to the fact that, that we're still talking about Jews uh, 2,000 years after the destruction of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem, right? You read the pages of the Old Testament, it's full of the stories of the Hittites and the Amorites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites. They were all larger and more powerful tribes than the Jews. But nobody's talking about them anymore, right? They've right. disappeared. They've disappeared from the mass of people. The, the, the Jews were without a homeland. They were without any uh, external means of coherence uh, to preserve their national identity for almost 2,000 years. And yet that identity was preserved. That is unprecedented in history. Not only was that identity preserved, but miracle of miracles, they actually regained their homeland which was the original place of it, which is also unprecedented. Um, and if you, so if you look at this mystery of the um, continuing existence of the Jews and of their return to Israel, you see that there's a mysterious role that they have to play in salvation history. They have, there's something very mysterious and special about their mission with respect to God as evidenced by this history itself. And if you look at anti-Semitism, and we spent a couple of shows on this, anti-Semitism itself shows that there's a mystery to the Jews, there's a mystery to their relationship to God. Because although most ethnic groups have been hated at various points in time by various people, there are not a lot of ethnic groups that have been hated at every point in time <laughs> by every other people among whom they've lived. The animosity directed towards the Jews, I will argue, is in itself a proof of their special role in salvation. 
or evidence of their special role in salvation. And all of this that you talk about, although you, you say it's a mystery, it's all prophesied. So we see the prophecies talking being about them fulfilled. being trod underfoot and then returning to their homeland. So it's unprecedented, but, but God prophesied it, and God has fulfilled That's right. it. And, is, I mean, I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm not the only one to have seen this, to say the least. Let me read a quote from our current Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, that he wrote um, in, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, before he was uh, elected to be the Bishop of Rome. Um, Okay, this, this, this is uh, in support of my statement about the role of the Jews being um, evidenced by history itself. The way that this tiny people, who no longer have any country, no longer any independent existence, but led their life scattered throughout the world and kept their own identity, the way the Jews are still Jews and are still a people, even though during the 2,000 years when they had no country, this is an absolute riddle. This phenomenon in itself shows us that something else is at work here. You can see in this way that there's something more than mere historical chance at work. The great powers of that period have all disappeared. Ancient Egypt and Babylon and Assyria no longer exist. Israel remains. And this shows us something of the steadfastness of God and something of the mystery of the Jewish people. Cardinal Ratzinger. That is, is Cardinal Ratzinger. Um, the, uh, I, I will be jumping around a little bit, but, but now kind of the, what I'm trying to do is show that the popes of the 20th century and the 21st century have really been in tune with this exposition that I've been making. So let me jump back now for a moment to the Holocaust okay. and, and the role of the Jews in salvation history that is revealed to us through the Holocaust itself. Now I suggested when we were talking about the Holocaust that um, there might have been some, uh, well, we know as, as Catholics and as Christians the, about the redemptive value of suffering. Right. That grace, if the coin that purchases grace is suffering. We know this most dramatically from the passion and death of Christ himself, right? When, when God became man, the one time in history, he became man primarily to suffer and die because of the infinite redemptive value of his suffering and the suffering of the rest of mankind contributes to that redemptive value through its uniting with the suffering of Christ. Um, I, I think that it is very logical to look at the Holocaust and to look at that immense corporate suffering, on the one hand of the world, but especially of the Jews, and see that in terms of the redemptive value of suffering, purchasing grace, and perhaps even purchasing the grace of the second coming. Just as you had the grace of the first coming of Christ in some sense prepared for by the slaughter of the innocents, this tremendous um, slaughter of innocent Jews at the time of the first coming, maybe there's some kind of mysterious poetic parallel there with the slaughter of the Jews in the Holocaust, maybe with an echo of purchasing the grace for the second coming. Now, this is radical for a number of reasons. One is most of the Jews who perished, perished in the Holocaust did not consciously unite their suffering with the suffering of Christ because they didn't know enough to. Now, there, there, there are two additional illuminations, though, to make about that. One is St. Edith Stein, who we talked about in an earlier episode, right. explicitly talked about being an intermediary, and because she knew about the redemptive value of suffering of her people united with the suffering of Christ. By her also dying in Auschwitz, she could somehow gather up the suffering of the other Jews and present it at the foot of the cross. And she made a statement suffering. along those lines as she was being taken from the convent. Yes, she said, she said to her sister the last recorded words as they were being led out of the convent to the van to take them to the concentration camp eventually was, um, come, let us go for our people. Our people. Um, but we also have, about this, we have a, a very mysterious and I think prophetic word from another pope, uh, Pope John XXIII, before he was pope, uh, when he was still a bishop in, in the uh, papal nuncio in Paris. Uh, when, at the end of the war, when the concentration camps when Auschwitz was liberated, the liberating Allied troops took film footage of it. And we saw the film footage of the liberation of Auschwitz he exclaimed, despite himself, he shouted out, 
This is the mystical body of Christ. Oh my. So, this, I mean, wow, oh my is right. I mean, maybe because Jews are related by blood to Christ, they're not related by faith to Christ explicitly, but they're related by blood, that maybe there was a very deep mystical um, redemptive value to that suffering united with Christ because they participated not by a union of faith, but by a union of blood. Well, and we, and we forget at times that, that that suffering united with Christ flows into the entire mystical body. So when he makes a statement like that, it, it, it's, it's a revelation of the Holy Spirit that, that this suffering was flowing into the mystical body. And how beautiful that is. Yeah. He, he um, maybe in, in, in the few minutes that we have, I'll just read some other papal quotes Please. that kind of um, uh, build up from, from, from the chair of Peter, so to speak, the, the stream of thought that I've been trying to express. This is another quote from John Twenty-Third when he was the Pope. Um, let me back up and give some explanation. There is a mystery, and I wish we had another 12 shows to talk about this, <laughs> but there is a mystery to the change in the attitude of the Catholic Church towards Judaism and the Jewish people in the last hundred years. Throughout most of the history of the Church, the Jews have been seen as a deicide people. They've been seen in the light of um, their role in the Gospels, of rejecting Jesus and participating in his condemnation. And very harsh things have been written about the Jewish people, <coughs> excuse me, by um, a number of uh, authorities in the church, including a number of saints. Yet in the last hundred years, we've seen this 180 degree shift and turnaround. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we saw this, actually, we saw this as began in um, the beginning of the 20th century. It, it began certainly or at least uh, it was very dramatic, under Pius XI in the 1930s. He really uh, definitively condemned anti-Semitism, and when he did so, he said, quote, anti-Semitism is uh, inadmissible spiritually. We are all Semites. This was already a little bit of a scandal at the time, because, you know, going from the sense of the Jews as the deicide people to him saying, look, spiritually, we're all Jews. And this you was in the 1930s? Mass, this is 1938. You know, in the Mass, uh, our, our, our father in faith, Abraham, our patriarch, Abraham, obviously, spiritually, the Church is a descendant of Abraham. Right. That's in there in the, in the theology. So you had that quote from Pius XI. Um, you had all that Pius XII did to save Jews during the war, which is a whole other topic. And then you had, you had John XXIII saying that about this is the mystical body of Christ. You had John XXIII saying, quote, we are conscious today that many centuries of blindness have cloaked our eyes so that we can no longer see the beauty of thy chosen people, nor recognize in their faces our privileged brethren. Forgive us for the curse we falsely attach to their name as Jews. Forgive us for crucifying thee a second time in their flesh, for we knew not what we did. I mean, you could unpack this for an well, hour. Well, I was going to say, you have the blindness again, where the Jews had the blindness to allow us in, and now here we're, we had the blindness, and now it looks like both eyes are open. It's exactly right. And now, now, now it's the time for the blindness of the Christians about the Jews to be lifted, so that they could recognize the beauty of thy chosen people. Now, there were centuries when it would have been a scandal for a pope to even say the beauty of thy chosen people that the Jews that were alive then were God's chosen people and, and beautiful in his eyes for that reason. Um, and then, uh, for, forgive us for the curse we falsely attach to their name as Jews. In other words, acknowledging that this curse of deicide was, in that sense, erroneous. Although it, it was, nonetheless, I think, uh, providential. I mean, in other words, everything is in God's plan. It was what was meant at the time, just like the blindness of the Jews was meant at the time. Then he says, forgive us for crucifying thee a second time in their flesh. So he's saying, he's, he's equating the Jewish people as a corporate Christ, right? Right, right back with the for, mystical body. Right back with the mystical body, that they're part of the mystical body of Christ, not through faith, but through blood. And so 
in, in the church's persecution of the Jews, the church was crucifying Christ a second time in their flesh, in the flesh of the Jews, which was united to the flesh of Christ through ties of blood. And then he says, for we knew not what we did, which of course is identifying with the people who crucified Christ when he says, forgive them for they know not what, what they do. Um, then um, then we, we had Nostra Aetata, we had the Second Vatican Council that uh, explicitly um, and doctrinally uh, negated the charge of deicide and said it's wrong to accuse the Jews of deicide. Um, and then we had John Paul II who said, again, unprecedentedly positive things about the Jews, including, I'll give a, a few quick quotes, um, in 1980 he said, quote, whoever meets Jesus Christ meets Judaism. Um, he said in 1986, he said, when he visited the synagogue of Rome, the first time in history that the Pope had visited a synagogue, the Jewish religion is not extrinsic to us, but is in a certain way intrinsic to our own religion. With Judaism, we have a relationship which we do not have with any other religion. You are our dearly beloved brothers, and in a certain way it could be said that you are our elder brothers. Okay, so that is, that's really, I mean, this, this ennobling of the concept of Judaism is, is really revolutionary. And that comes back to what you laid out in earlier show about the, um, the older brother having favor. Where you showed the examples through scripture that, that had favor, and then that was given, the blessing was given to one of the younger siblings. And you, point, you pointed that out earlier, so he's saying the same thing. That's exactly right, and that what you're referring to is this, this fact that um, throughout the beginning of the Old Testament, there was a special blessing that was supposed to pass from father to eldest son, right. and consistently the eldest son blew it, and it was passed to the younger son instead. And that this is a picture of uh, the relationship between Judaism and the Gentiles, because the blessing that the father wanted, in some sense, to give to the eldest son is the father being God and the eldest son being the Jews, because they were his first children, so to speak. Was, but they blew it, and so it passed on to the younger son, like, um, like uh, Cain blew it and the blessing passed on to, uh, to Abel, and Esau blew it and the blessing passed on to Jacob and Reuben blew it and the blessing passed on to Joseph. Generation after generation, the same pattern. The same thing happened with salvation, with the blessing meant for the Jews passing on to the Gentiles, but then, then the Gentiles eventually bringing in the Jews. And I'm left with the image as we talk about the return of the Jews of the prodigal son. That's exactly right. That's like the ultimate perfect picture of this. You can, I mean, that parable works on a lot of different levels with a lot of right. interpretations. I'm not saying this is the only one, but it works very well. You can see the elder son, who is always faithful to the father, or thought he was always faithful to the father, being the Jews. The prodigal son, who went out and, and um, broke all of the moral laws and ended up feeding pigs, right? And pigs were the emblem of the Gentiles, of the pagans, uh, being the Gentiles. And then, but then that younger son who had chosen depravity, coming back contritely to the father and receiving his blessing and being brought back in, being the Gentiles, being brought into the church. And what's the elder son do? He's all snooty right. and full of himself and proud like the Pharisees and is actually distancing himself from the father by his attitude of superiority and entitlement, one can see as being a picture of, um, of the Jews. The beauty of the tapestry. We spoke in one of the earlier shows about the the beautiful tapestry that God's weaving, and we don't always see it from the top, but from the bottom. And you've helped to, un to put so much of this together to see the beauty of this tapestry. And I see that with the return of the Jewish people and the return of this deeper understanding that, that we don't have. But unfortunately, we don't have time. These shows need to be a little longer because I was really well, enjoying that. You so can pick up from here next we'll time. We'll pick up at the next show from this. We want to thank you for joining us again, and hopefully you'll join us again next time as we uh, continue to unpack this with Roy Schumann. Thank you. God bless.